Less subtle. You have to become less subtle in your efforts to communicate non verbally with me. I can never do. Yes. Okay, we will resume. We're back live streaming at this point. So you may continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mo, um, did you go to Saco, the Saco base for weekend drill the weekend of September 1st? No. Why not? Um, trying to get back to that day, to the to September here. Work conflict. I had a work conflict. Now, on that date, um, did you speak with Sergeant Wilmot in your department about a conversation that he had had with Sergeant Schofield um, of Second Hawk County Sheriff's Office concerning Robert Clark? Yes. Sergeant Wilmot? He is, uh, he's the supervisor in the day shift opposite of my day shift. Why was um, Deputy Bagley no longer involved? Um, he still would have been. Um, that was on a Saturday, so Deputy Bagley was not there. He was off on that day. Uh, I'm sorry, not Deputy, Detective Bagley. What, what did um, Sergeant Wilmot tell you about his conversation with Sergeant Schofield? Paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact gist of it, but he had said that they had gone to the house, knocked on the door. There was nobody there, and the car wasn't there. I'm sorry, they knocked on the door, uh, and there, the car wasn't there, and there was no one there. So they sent out the file one. Well, let me see if this helps refresh okay, your recollection. According to um, Sergeant Wilmot's report, Sergeant Schofield told him that on September. Um, 16, that he had knocked on the door of Card's residence, heard him moving around inside, but that he refused to come to the door. And Sergeant Schofield had asked for a number for the next in command for the unit. Yes, I do remember that. And did he, do you recall his telling you that Sergeant Schofield was going to call the Saco barracks and the feds as well? Yes. And who did you understand the feds to be um, the FBI uh, because of the threat was made against the United States Army Reserve. Um, use the word armory, but um, facility. And um, did Sergeant Wilmot give you Sergeant Schofield's telephone number? Yes, he did. And did you call Sergeant Schofield uh, on approximately 1035 on September 16th? Yes, I did. And what did you tell him? Um, he had said that he was looking for uh, the, on someone higher in command than me, which was fine. And so I gave him Captain Reamer's name and telephone. Right. Um, according to Sergeant Schofield's report, you told him that Army command staff is in the process of encouraging Card to retire from the military on the condition he obtained mental health treatment. Do you recall telling him that? Was, was that true as of September 16th? I, I don't know. Um, do you recall telling Sergeant Schofield, as he's reported, that you believe Hodgson's message was over the top or Hodgson was an alarmist or something along those lines? No, ma'am. And 
did you ever tell Sergeant Schofield in this conversation about the, again, the Army directive that while a military duty Sergeant Card not have access to weapons? Right. And again, why wouldn't you have told Sergeant Schofield that? <laughs> That conversation was very quick. He asked for Mexican command and I gave him Captain Reamer's number. Uh, after your conversation, did you call Captain Reamer? Yes. What was that discussion? Just to let him know that I'd spoken with the deputy and he would be giving him a call. Um, did you express to Captain Reamer at that time that you didn't know if alerting the Sokol police was the right thing to do because it blew this thing way up? I'll say that no. And you don't recall Captain Reamer saying in response to that, well, it's too late now? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know. After a conversation with Deputy Schofield on September 16th, did you hear anything further about any action taken by the Saco, um, Sagadaha County Sheriff's Office? No, ma'am, I did not. As of that date, were you satisfied that the Army's request for a welfare check had been satisfied? No, ma'am. Why not? What more did you think should have been done? Contact was never made. Did you go to drill the following day on September 17th? No, ma'am. And why not? Uh, same, work conflict. Did you talk with anyone about what happened at the Saco Army base um, that weekend? I don't recall. I mean, I've, I've had several conversations over that weekend. I mean, because I was actually working the whole weekend. But at some point, did you learn that um, Sergeant Carr did not show up at the base? Yes, Captain Reamer did tell me that because we, even though I wasn't there and I was working, I was still in contact with Captain Reamer. Right. Well, and what what did Captain Reamer tell you? I believe that just that he didn't he didn't come to drill that weekend. And that's all I remember about the conversations. So focusing on the time period between September 17th and October 25th, following September 17th, did you have any contact with Robert Card? No, I reached out again a couple more times, just on the off chance that he had answered my call, but he never answered my call. Did he show up for October drill? I don't believe so. No. Did you have any conversations with anyone about Robert Carr? I mean, there were many between Sergeant Major, Captain Reamer, myself. So I guess I don't understand the question, I guess. I mean, I well, know I had it several. Following the weekend um, where the threats had been made. Yes, ma'am. As reported by Staff Sergeant Hodgson. Mm -hmm. And October, October 25th, the date of the shooting, did you have any conversations with anyone about Robert Card? No, ma'am, not that I can recall specific. Were your concerns about Sergeant Card's threats against you resolved? No. And why were they not resolved in your opinion? Contact was never made with cards. That's contact was never made. As of um, September 17th, did you have information about the status of Sergeant Card's mental health? Hold on a no. second. Wait, yeah. 
Mr. Shetland, the floor closes. Lost the interpreter at the moment. Split screen. Maybe ALS has disappeared. Oh, okay. That's why we <laughs> I heard something shut down behind me. Yeah. Sure. Shut it down and restart. Thanks, it's still watching. Which is okay. It's still in there. It's the Zoom link that bumped it on. We're still live, but it's the Zoom's not letting him connect. Reset. Do I need to shut the people back? Yeah. Kevin, you might need to reboot because the Zoom live is still happening and there's still people in the Zoom. So it's got to be something on your end.
We're live. Okay, we are back online and you may continue. Thank you, Chair. Well, as of September 17th, did you believe that Robert Card can still suffering from a mental illness? Yes. And I believe that you testified earlier that based on your training you received from the Army um, and law enforcement that you thought he might be suffering from schizophrenia. Yes, ma'am. As of September 17th, did you still believe that Sergeant Card was a threat to himself and others? Yes. And that's because nothing had been done to convince you otherwise. Yes, ma'am. Following um, the weekend of September 16th and 17th until October 25th, was anything done by you to gauge Sergeant Card's mental health and determine if he continued to be a threat to himself and others? Other than reaching out to him, no man. Um, at this point, he did alienated Sergeant uh, Hodgson as well. So, and did that alienation of somebody that was his close friend further concern you about his mental status and his his threat? Yes, ma'am. Since uh, as of that date, no contact had yet been made by the Sagadahawk County Sheriff's Office with Sergeant Carr. Did you contact the the sheriff's office to inquire as to what your plans were? No, ma'am, I did not. Why not? Law enforcement community, if I make a complaint to you or, or do a, a request, if I tell you how to do your job, you're going to hang up on me. Well, um, it isn't a matter of telling them to do their job. Uh, did you make any inquiry as to what they thought their continuing job was. I did not. Detective Bagley um, actually did the check will be in request, so I, I backed away and let him handle that. Now, I heard you say several times um, during the course of this discussion that it was your obligation to take care of the service members under your supervision. Yes, ma'am. What, during this time frame, did you do to take care of Robert Card when you believe that he was continuing to suffer from a mental illness and was a continuing threat to himself and others? That's a great question. Uh, the request for the check well-being was what I did because uh, while we're not under orders or on drill weekend, I have no authority over him. I can't go down and kick in his door and go in. Um, that's why I had the request made of the Sagadaw County Sheriff's Department to do that check well-being, to gauge his mental fitness or his mental health, and to see if he was still on that path that he needed help, psychological help, That's if that's what it came to. But and they didn't do anything. No, ma'am. So what did you do? There was nothing I could do. I mean, I had no authority over him. Well, we've discussed the Army Reserve's psychological um, program that you're familiar with. Yes, ma'am. You could have contacted them, could you not? Yes, I could have. I because guess. they're a resource that the Army Reserve makes available to service members and their families in exactly these <laughs> sorts of situations. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, on paper. Well, on paper, but you never contacted. No, because I contacted Sagadahawk County Sheriff's Department and asked them to do a check well-being. So when you passed it off to Sagadahawk County Sheriff's Office, you felt that you had handled the situation? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Did you have any conversations with Captain Reamer during this period of time um, about what more could be done to get Sergeant Card's 
the guns out of his house. No, ma'am. Now, on October 23rd, Detective Bagley spoke with you about Sergeant Carr. Did he not? And what did what was that conversation? He just let me know that the contact still hadn't been made and the file safe was still out there. Um, and according to Detective Bagley's report, you said that Card was not helping himself out by cooperating with the military, so they will be forcing him out with a discharge in the next few days. Do you recall making that statement? Um, I said that he's not helping or working with us, and, and once he gets a certain number of views or unsatisfactory attendance or unauthorized absence, I'm sorry, then he would be kicked out of the army, or he would be discharged from the military. So not helping himself out by cooperating was not showing up at drill? Correct. And the discharge was going to be based on his absenteeism, not his behavioral health? Correct. And had there been discussions with somebody about discharging him for his absenteeism? Um, any soldier who's who gets used or um, unauthorized absence from from drill weekend, we send out letters, and those letters tell them if they get so many more, they're done. That they, they will be out processed from the military. Uh, so and that's just that's just. I'm sorry. No, I. I was just gonna, that's just normal business. Was that going to be your job to discharge him for absenteeism? I mean, our job was to make sure that the views were done that the letters were sent since he's not answering my phone calls especially that uh, that the letters were sent to him stating you've missed this many uh you've been unauthorized this many times and you, you, you have this many more times and you're out um do you know whether this had been communicated to sergeant card i we don't were... i might have a moment Did you at any time during this period have a conversation with Captain Reamer about the yellow flag? We may have talked about it. Captain Reamer actually lives in New Hampshire. Oh, they don't have that there. So he may, we may have talked about it, but I honestly, I, I can't remember the conversation if we did. Well, according to Captain Reamer, you had a conversation in which you said, it's very, very difficult to do, and you have to find the right cop to do it. There's a lot of work and a lot of paperwork that comes with it. It can be done, but it has to be done by the officer in that county or whoever's in the jurisdiction. That. Yes, ma'am. And when would you have had that conversation? Probably been two weeks into it, uh, two to three weeks into after the filing, the file six or after filing the check will be a request. But that was not intended on your part to discourage seeking a yellow flag order because you yourself had successfully obtained one. Is that correct? That was in frustration and talking with my commander. Uh, that was me being frustrated. Frustrated about what? That, and it hadn't been done yet. And again, you never reached out to Saginaw Hawk County and law enforcement officer to law enforcement officer or Army First Sergeant to law enforcement officer and talked about that and requested that it be done. No. What was the next thing you heard about Robert Card? So. The 25th, week of October. That's the last time. 
the next time that I got out of here. Text from Hodgson with a photograph. <clears throat> and the photograph was of a guy with hair and a beard committing murder. And he said it was Robert Card. I've never seen Card with hair or a beard. So at first, my brain was like, no, it's not him. At what point did you learn that it was him? Uh, shortly thereafter. And what was your reaction at that time? Oh. Broke my heart. Um, and when you say it broke your heart, was your heart broken for the families that had been involved? Yes. Was your heart broken for Sergeant Card? No. Why not? I was mad at Sergeant Card. But we you... gave him options. We get him to a hospital. Nobody else did that. We gave him the opportunity for treatment, and he denied it, refused it, and wouldn't move along with it. And then he took it out. You know, some people. Well, he was discharged from the hospital, and yet following his discharge, he continued, as you said, to suffer from mental health issues, in your opinion, schizophrenia, and yet nothing was done to obtain him help at that point. Is that correct? That is correct. So did you feel at all sad for Sergeant Card that the help his family had started seeking back in May from the army was not provided. That night, no. At some point, did you change your mind? I wouldn't say I changed my mind. I just, no, I didn't change my mind. No, those people are innocent. We're soldiers. We protect and defend. And I understand mental health issues. I get that. Hurt innocent people. Um, on October 25th, when you learned that the shooter was, in fact, Sergeant Card, um, did you leave your home? Um, yes. Well, I was actually working. And uh, the deputy chief, captain, and one of the detectives showed up in my house. Got my wife out of there, my son, two of my sons, and uh, took them to another location. And why was that? Uh, just in case he was coming north because nobody knew where he was. And because he'd earlier made a threat against you yeah. in September. Yeah. Did you have any involvement with the post shooting um, manhunt? Or criminal investigation. I was contacted by state police detectives who uh, basically asked me, you know, what the, what the history was with him. Um, some questions that they asked: uh, if he did electrical work or was a carpenter on the side, which was odd to me. But I said, no, I didn't know uh, anything about that. But they did uh, ask about this uh, scope, the the. Uh, thermal imaging scope. And um, so I told them about that. What did, you, what did you tell them about a thermal imaging scope? Well, that he had purchased this uh, this imaging scope. And I, I'm almost positive he said he was for, or he told Hodgson that it was for uh, coyotes, and they coyotes. Uh, but he, one thing that I did remark on was that he said it was around $10,000 for the scope. So, I knew that it was probably a pretty good one. It wasn't something that you can get on Amazon for two fifty. dollars So uh, where this manhunt was taking place at night, I wanted to make sure they understood that he had this capability to pick them up and to see them when they could not see him. And um, you had learned all of this from Staff Sergeant Hodge? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mona. I don't have any questions. We have to suspend today at 5 o'clock because of the availability of interpreters and reporters. So I'm going to suggest, unless there's an objection, that 
the commission to defer any further questions and we will determine whether it's necessary to bag and devote the remainder of our time to uh, Captain Reamer, who is here from Mash or from uh, New Hampshire. Is, is, there any, is there any objection to that? No. no. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Okay. Get my sergeants mixed up here. Right on. Thank you very much for perfect. your attendance today, and we'll be in touch with you if there's an occasion for further questions. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. If you would take the stand. Remain standing if you would. You state your name. Jeremy Reamer. And you swear that the testimony and Matter now in hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. You may be seated. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Dilworth will be leading the examination of this. We'll leave these exhibits for you. Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Captain Reamer, if I uh, Ask any questions that are unclear or, or ambiguous, will you let me know? And I'll refrain. Uh, are you on any medications today uh, that would make it uh, difficult for you to understand my questions or answer them accurately? No, sir. You're not represented by counsel today, are you? Uh, no, sir. If at any point in time you want to ask for a break, just uh, do so, and the chair will. will uh, Grant you that, but I would ask that you answer the question uh, before we, we break, okay? Yes, sir. Um, we got some texts this morning or last night, um, and we haven't really had a chance to go through it, so we may need to have you come back uh, anyway, but I'm going to expedite this. We were a little short on expected time that we would, uh, or the time we expected to have uh, with you. Um, so I'm going to skip some areas that I plan to uh, to uh, inquire about. Okay, yes, sir. Um, just briefly tell us how you uh, first came uh, to know Robert Card. Uh, I first came to know Robert Card um, when I became the company commander for Bravo Company. When was that? Um, August of 20, uh, 2021. How did he come to your attention? He was on on my roster. Did you know him well? Or then... No, I. Um, he was just he was a he was a soldier in the unit. Um, I didn't have a personal relationship with him. He was, as people have indicated before, quiet, reserved. Um, and as a company commander, I don't necessarily speak with every single person um, in my company. I'm also focusing on other duties at the time. Okay. Now he was. Uh... A hand grenade uh, trainer instructor, correct? One of the missions we had in my first year was hand grenade. Yes, sir. Just briefly describe that uh, training process at West Point. How many how many times would he be involved in throwing live grenades in a given day? Uh, so he at West Point, he would um, outside of um, a validation by the. Uh, leadership at West Point, he wouldn't be throwing um, any live grenades. Live grenades were thrown by the cadets. Um, I do not know exactly uh, in my time being there as a company commander what his, uh, I cannot remember what his specific role that year was um, in terms of throwing gr uh, grenades for the train. Technically, um, we have um, that year, uh, you have mock bays, um, you have instruction on the proper throwing, which we use um, we call them blueberries. Basically, it's it's not an actual grenade, but it has the same feel of it and the same idea and the mechanism, but it doesn't have the explosive powers um, as, a, as an actual hand grenade. Um, so I can't tell you exactly him and that in my capacity as being his commander, if how many he threw. Um, if, if he was a pit NCO, which is the, the NCOs that are out at the live hand grenade um, observing the cadets. Um, so if that answers your question, sir. Okay. But you you weren't involved in the day to day operation or his his day to day activities relating to that. In regards to at West Point, yes, at West Point. Um, during that 
because I've only been there for two years. Uh, during the summer that we did do the hand grenades, um, there was a uh, company, there was another captain from West Point that ran the live hand grenade. I was more of, um, I oversaw another area of the hand grenade training, uh, more of the practice area um, at a different thing. Um, I did go down and observe um, the hand grenades being thrown, but I wasn't necessarily in charge of that actual range, sir. Let me go to May of 2023. Did uh, Sergeant Hodgson call you about uh, about uh, Robert Card? May of 2023. Yes. Not in May of 2023. No, sir. When did he first call you? Um, he spoke with me. Um, I believe it was a spring of 2023, possibly March of 23. What do you recall him saying? Um, as uh, kind of indicated with. Uh, First Sergeant Mote, it was in regards to, um, he called on behalf of Sergeant Card. Uh, are we, I, I apologize, are we talking about Sergeant Card or Sergeant Hodgson? Hodgson, Hodgson. Hodgson call you? Yes, Hodgson did call me um, back in, and in, in, I believe it to be March of 23, um, indicating he was calling on behalf of Sergeant Card um, regarding people at the unit, uh, calling him a pedophile behind his back. Um, I tried to get more information as far as who specifically was saying this. Um, he didn't provide anything more. Um, I said, did Sergeant Card want to speak with me? He didn't say anything. So um, after I got home with Sergeant Hodgson, I informed my uh, battalion commander of what I uh, what was discussed. Um, and later that week, um, for an unrelated um, to, uh, discussion regarding Hodgson, I did ask Hodgson, who called me, um, how um, Sergeant Card was doing and if you would like to speak any more about it and he said no he didn't want to speak with me anymore and had moved on Was it an unusual thing for uh, a sergeant uh, to call you about a matter like that? Sergeant Hodgson calling me in regards to what he what he ended up reporting Yes, It's not un uncommon for sergeants to call me um, and especially with Sergeant Hodgson um, because of his history um, with me we, we've gotten to know each other through multiple conversations. So that wasn't unheard of. And he was calling to, um, on behalf of Sergeant Card. So that, well, that wasn't uncommon, sir. But he wasn't asking you to do anything on behalf of- uh, No, I did uh, ask like what he was, you know, what he was looking for. Like I, I needed more information than just, you know, cause being in law enforcement as I am now, um, I needed kind of like, I needed essentially a complainant, to, you know, some a victim to kind of talk to me about what was being heard. And since he wasn't providing much more details and neither was Sergeant Card wanting to talk to me any further. Let me turn to May then. Did you learn that uh, Deputy Carlton from Second Hawk uh, Sheriff's Office had called uh, Administrator Getchell? Um, in May, um, what I can remember is I got a con I got uh, a call from First Sergeant Mo. You got a phone call from who? First Sergeant Mo. First Sergeant Moat, sir. Okay. So you didn't ever speak to uh, Administrator Getchell? Not that I can recall, sir. Okay. What is Administrator Getchell's job? What at that where his duties? At that time, he the best way to describe he was a full time. Um, he kind of played two hats, but in regards to this, he was a civilian that acted as a full-time personnel that um, helped assist with um, any kind of the duties that the battalion commander, who, who was also only a TPU, so a temporary, you know, reservist, he kind of filled in any of those um, duties that needed to be there um, after informing um, the battalion commander himself. So whatever Deputy Carlton... <laughs> Uh, said to uh, Administrator Getchley, you heard through Sergeant Moat? Um, what I heard um, on uh, May 3rd from uh, First Sergeant Moat was that, um, and my, my recollection is that there was an incident regarding um, a, a altercation or a confrontation at a, I've understood to be a hardware store, possibly a uh, um, I understood it to be Home Depot, um, where he was with his family, um, and he uh, believed people were talking about him um, behind his back. Uh, the 
my understanding was that the sheriff's county was responded uh, where he was not um he wasn't arrested uh, there was no hospitalization that was the the initial uh that i remembered and then i uh, confirmed from first arm mo uh, but later would uh, received text messages um, and our contact from First Iron Mode stating uh, that there was a, an intervention with the family uh, regarding uh, they were seeking him help, um, discussion about the hearing aids. Uh, and um, yes, I, I, that was that's what I can recall. In early May, do you also recall um, Sergeant Mode telling you that? Uh, um, Robert Card has been accusing others of calling him a pedophile. I can't recall specifically back in May. I that that was. I, I mean, yes. I I just stated it. Yes, um, in regards to the the incident at uh, Home Depot, that was um, people talking me on the back. I understood that would probably be what what he was hearing. And uh, did you did you ever sit down with? Uh, Robert Card, to talk to him about this? I did not. Um, I was, uh, due to personal as well as uh, injury, um, I was not, uh, did not attend the April uh, Battle Assembly, May Battle Assembly, or June Battle Assembly due to personal as well as uh, medical reasons. So I was not in person. And as we discussed earlier, I'm from New Hampshire, so I did not have a face-to-face, uh, -face, but I did not, um, neither did I, I make a phone call either, sir. Um, did Sergeant Mo tell you that, according to Deputy Carlton, Robert Card answered the door uh, to family members with a gun in his hand? I cannot recall if First Sergeant Mo was the one that told me, or if I was at that point at the at the. I cannot recall when I found that out. I eventually, I did find out. I cannot recall if that was during the May. Um, or when I found that offer that came from another um, another individual. What did that tell you about Robert Card's relationship with his family? Um, to be honest, because it was a uh, kind of this person said to this person said to me, um, I didn't know the full context of exactly what was um, outside of answering the door. Um, wasn't sure exactly the full context of of, of that inter or that interaction or what that was reported to the police at that time. You just didn't know what to make of it at that point. Yes, sir. Did uh, you recommend any counseling uh, to Card in May or June? The um, you understand after I spoke with First Sergeant Moat was to um, knowing that the police were involved um, and knowing that at that time and after kind of what they have done that they did not take him into protective custody from my understanding um, and they did not do um, and there's nothing the family did not hospitalize him from my understanding um, and that the sheriff's county uh, agreed to inform us if he wasn't voluntarily. Uh, that we were to uh, discuss with him um, potential ways that we could help him uh, from the military side, sir. And did you do that? Um, since I was not there, I did not do the face-to-face, -face, and I will say no, I did not call him. So who did the face-to-face? -face? Um, I cannot, I, I do not know if that face-to-face -face occurred. You're not sure if it occurred at all? I I, I was not there, so I cannot and comment. No, never told you there was a face-to-face. Uh, not that I can recall. So do you have any reason to believe that there was a face-to-face? -face? I cannot recall what someone did um, that, that, that weekend. Without being there. You don't know, you have no reason to think there was a face-to-face, -face, do you? I have no reason to think there was a face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Um, as First Sergeant had testified recently, he saw him from a distance. I I trust that First Sergeant Mo, um, in, in his actions, but I did not get confirmation from First Sergeant Mo that a face-to-face -face conversation occurred. Um, yeah, Sergeant Card went to the training program at West Point in uh, in July, right? Yes, sir. Were there any restrictions on his access to firearms? 
for weapons at that time? Uh, no, sir. Um, and he was going to train the cadets with regard to the hand grenades, right? Not hand grenades, sir. What was he going to do? Um, as for our, we, um, our mission that we were doing that year was cruise surf weapons, sir. Okay. And his job was in line? His job was what? what was, how would you characterize his job? Um, well, according to First Iron Mode, I, I, to be honest, I couldn't recall exactly what he did, but according to First Iron, if he was a line supervisor or a line safety, um, as, as I would refer back to his testimony, that, that's what a line safety does. And uh, you uh, learned from a phone call about cards misconduct at West Point? Yes, sir. And you heard uh, Sergeant Mode's testimony today? I did, sir. Was it accurate regarding how you learned uh, about the about your conversations with Sergeant Moat regarding his misconduct at West Point? Well, the thing I would add is that they did actually contact me the night before on, on uh, July 15th. Um, it was, I don't know if it was Master and York or First Sergeant Moat that ended up calling me, I can't remember, um, but they did call me and I did have a conversation. They filled me in um, and that part of his testimony it was actually more than what I um, understood, and he did more. But the, the general gist of what was explained uh, during his testimony is accurate, and what they explained to me, and that he decided to uh, have him sleep it off that night um, and re engage in the morning. Um, and then, yes, as he indicated, uh, they did inform me um, that they were still, uh, Sergeant First Class Guard was being uncooperative um, and not answering the door and not being. Uh, uh, basically being uncooperative and um, that they, that the decision for a commander that I decided that uh, based on their advice and guidance, um, as well as their experience, that a command directed behavioral health evaluation was necessary um, and stated that, yes, I would like to go forward with that. Um, and they, they proceeded to, um, as First Army Mode explained, all the details there, that's what they, they ended up doing. Um, as I initially um, was contacted in the morning, realized that he wasn't coming out of the room and they were having issues um, being the closest as well as his commander and a commissioned officer. Um, I decided that it was better for me to be um, at the, as we call the military, the friction point. Um, so I'd be down there in the event that my, my anticipation when I left was that he was still going to refuse to come out of the, out of the door and that I wanted, um, if he was going to be someone knocking at the door and opening it, I wanted to be there as the commissioned officer um, telling him he needed to go there. But uh, about an hour or two into my uh, four, maybe four and a half hour drive, um, First Sergeant Motes stated um, that they were able to get um, Sergeant Card to go with them and that they were on their way to um, Keller Army Hospital, uh, Community Hospital, sir. And you ordered him to the hospital because he posed a risk of harm? You wanted him evaluated? Based on um, the advice, um, I trust my first sergeant um, and his experience, both as law enforcement and as well as his first sergeant, um, as well as Master Sergeant Yurik and his law enforcement, as well as his um, experience in the Army. Um, and what they were stating to me that, yes, I believe that he, he needed to be evaluated um, mm -hmm. for his mental health um, and, you know, posed the danger. Yes. Now, you arrived at the hospital at about what time? I want to say approximately 3 p.m. Sorry. What did you do when you got there? Uh, I responded, walked into the emergency room at Army Keller, or the Keller Army Community Hospital, uh, where I met up with um, Sar uh, Sergeant Reed, Sergeant Noyes, uh, Sergeant Wainwright, uh, and kind of got to fill in up at that point because there's no one from the staff that was immediately there. Got filled in on kind of what I already knew. Um, and at one point, um, I introduced, I talked to the staff up front and said who I was. I was Captain Reamer. I was here to, you know, fill out any paperwork that needed to be done. Um, and I was CARD's uh, uh, commander, at which point a uh, Captain Dickinson, um, who was the on-call psychologist, uh, came uh, out and uh, then spoke with me about the uh, the uh, his his eval and and the incident with me, sir. What did he tell you about his evaluation? He stated that he was glad that he was there. Um, the card was, he, he was he, he so. Was Captain Dickinson stated that he was glad that Sergeant Card was here based on what his evaluation of him, initial evaluation of him, um, there, and that the plan was that he needed a higher level care, 
Um, he did bring up concerns regarding the personally owned firearms um, that he had. Um, but at that point, he was still in the, uh, in, uh, in the triage room or one of the rooms in the back of the hospital. So I did not get to speak with Card. Okay. Dickinson say about Card's possession of privately owned firearms? That it was a, a concern. <laughs> Can you expound on what he meant by concern? Um, I'm not, I cannot remember um, if he told me the exact, you know, tell me the exact um, discussions with him, but just that, you know, his behavior, his mannerisms, and his like anger um, that he was exhibiting while speaking with him, um, and that he had mentioned uh, his firearms. Um, but I do not recall, uh, he didn't say anything specific regarding his actual conversations, but that, you know, the, his firearms got brought up and he uh, he discussed that um, uh, with me. Sir. Did Dickinson say he shouldn't have personal or firearms at home? He did not say he shouldn't have personal firearms. He just said he was concerned about his personally owned firearms. Okay. Can we turn to Exhibit 10A? In the um, second set of documents. See that? It's up in the upper right hand yes. corner. Yes, it's in the Yes, sir. Um, have you seen that document before? No, I have not, sir. Okay, well, I just want to ask you a question, um, a couple of questions. Turn to page 12, uh, the bottom right hand corner. Page 12, as in the bottom of page, or page 12? Page 12 of 132, you see? Bottom right hand corner. What what paragraph am I? Um, the bottom paragraph, starting on the third line. Writer, meaning Dickinson, spoke with patient's commander after admission and relayed concerns about patient's access to personal firearms at home. Writer informed patient command was looking into having firearms removed from patient's home and stated to writer that patient's brother had at one point in the past removed firearms as well for an unknown reason. Is that is that consistent with your recollection of the conversation? Not my initial comment. No, that was not what um, um, my conversation, that initial conversation with Captain Dickinson, no. Did you ever have a conversation with Dickinson that was along these lines? With Captain Dickinson, not that I can recall. <laughs> Would you, you have any conversations with anybody uh, at the New York hospitals along these lines? The, the hospitals, no. So, is it factually? What, what do you uh, recall that's different about uh, this statement? So. The conversation I had with Captain Dickinson was the concern for having owning uh, having um, fire personally owned firearms. Um, the information that is in this that we we just read um, was relayed to me through Staff Sergeant Hodgson uh, because at my time down at um, West Point, um, outside of a conversation with. Um, Coming from the Army or the Keller Army Hospital, saying that there there's meetings regarding um, Sergeant Card between Keller and uh, Four Winds um, that I was not invited to. Uh, that I had not received any uh, conversation from Four Winds. Um, my only really insight into what was occurring in Four Winds came from Staff Sergeant Hodgson, who Sergeant Card was able to contact from the hospital. He was essentially my my into what was going on into uh, at the hospital, and then the discussion regarding the firearms and the plan that I understood from uh, speaking with Staff Sergeant Hodgson was that the family um, Staff or Sergeant First Class Card uh, consented to, and uh, the family agreed to remove the firearms from the uh, from his residence. Um, that, that was the that was the agreement 
a civil agreement that I, I understood too. But this did not come from Captain Dickens. So, so and uh, just to make sure I understand, do you think that Sergeant Hodson was the source of this much of this information? For me personally, yes. And the next sentence is the patient's mother also confirmed that the majority of the patient's firearms are stored in his father's gun locker. Your gun safe. Did you know that? From Seth Sarn Hodgson, yes. Did you relate that to Dickinson or do you think that uh, Hodgson did? I did not relay that to Captain Dickinson. Uh, because at that point he had been moved on to Four Winds um, Hospital, and I do know they had communication back and forth. I don't know what they spoke about, but uh, yet yeah, this was um, this was spoken to me by um, or this is spoken to me by uh, Staff Sergeant Hudson. And then on the next page, first sentence, it says, Treatment Team Informed Safe Act was also completed prior to patient being hospitalized at four weeks. Patient was informed of this and reported the intent to hire a lawyer to appeal. Do you know what the Safe Act is? Did you know at any point in time that the New York hospitals had? Uh, we're, we're trying to restrict his access to guns. In New York hospitals? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell her, tell her in, forward. in terms of what, sir? His access to firearms. Trying to restrict his access to firearms, like the red flag law. I was not, uh, I was not aware of the hospitals attempting to restrict his firearms, no, sir. Let's turn to 10C. You with me? Uh, yes, sir. I'm on the This is a note by Matthew Dickinson on uh, July 28, 2023, correct? Yes, sir. And it says, spoke with Commander Jeremy Reamer from Service Members Unit on July 27 at 1700 hours via telephone. Reviewed findings on DA3822 that service member, due to current symptoms of psychosis and paranoia, was referred to higher level of care at Four Winds Hospital, right? You know, you know what a 3822 is, right? I do, sir. What is it? I can't remember the title of it, but it's my understanding of it. It is it's his evaluation of um, Captain Dickinson's evaluation of yeah. our starting card. And they, he also discussed with you discharge planning for the service member, and uh, you discussed starting medical board process. Is that accurate? I cannot recall that conversation, sir. Did you ever talk to anybody at the hospitals about uh, the medical board process? I did not, sir. did not. No, what, what does it mean when somebody refers to in the military as the medical board process? I can, I can explain my understanding of it. I am not by any means an expert in it. Um, I have, uh, well, what I understand a medical board process is essentially a, a member goes through a uh, meets up with medical professionals um, where they discuss um, possibly looking at uh, separating from the army for medical reasons. You don't recall any conversations with anybody at the New York hospitals regarding uh, initiation of proceedings to have him removed? 
I do not recall. Separated from the military for medical reasons? Uh, I do not recall any conversations about any hospital, sir. Sergeant Moe, tell you uh, anything along those lines? Not that I can remember, sir. So this is all news to you? Uh, now, uh, no, at the time, yes. There's the next uh, sentence. It was also discussed with commander about making sure that steps are taken to remove weapons from service members' home <clears throat> to ensure safety. Commander did not have any questions or concerns about our conversation. Is that consistent with your recollection of the conversation? That is um, the understanding at that point. Um, I can't recall when I had the conversation with uh, St uh, Staff Sergeant Hodgson was that the removal was going to be done uh, by the family under uh, the civil agreement that they would remove the weapons from, from the house, sir. So the plan, the Army's plan was to have this family do it? Well, it is one, uh, one of the way, and that was the plan that um, I've been advised was enacted, um, which is a way to remove the weapons from the presence but you'd agree that families have def difficulty policing their own right yes in some sense instances yes sir and certainly you had no reason to think that this was a functional family or at least I take that back that, that robert card was a, a functioning member of that family i cannot comment on that because i do not know their dynamic well, you know, he met his siblings at the door with a gun, right? You'd been told that. I understand. But again, as I discussed, it, the context of that, whether it was because of them specifically or because of another, I, I did not know the full context of that. So. But given that context, did you think it was likely that they were going to be able to control him and get his guns? Since they, I believe that they could, yes, because of they agreed to do so. If they didn't think that they could, there would be no reason why they would agree to do so, sir. They agreed to get the guns or to try to get the guns? From my understanding, from speaking with Staff Sergeant Hodgson, they agreed to remove the weapons from the home. Well, we'll get to that. Um, wait, did you agree with Wilson that um, it was important to remove the weapons from his home? Yes. And um, you did get the 3822, right? Yes, sir. Let's look at that. That's um, Exhibit 10B, a couple pages in front. Yes, sir. I'm on it. And that's entitled the Report of Mental Status Evaluation, correct? Yes, sir. And about a quarter of the way down the uh, first page, it says service member currently does not meet medical retention standards, has reached medical retention determination point, and the disability evaluation system referral is indicated. You see that? Yes, sir. What do you take that to mean? That according to I believe it was Captain Dickinson who did this. Um, that it was his determination they did not meet medical medical intensive standards. So he seems to be separated from the military. That he should um, be yes for medical reasons. Yes, and those medical records reasons would be psychiatric. According to this, yes. And then uh, about halfway down the. Page in section three, it refers to pertinent findings on mental status evaluation. Do you see that? I do, yes, sir. And it lists his uh, cognition, perceptions, behavior, and impulsivity as abnormal, correct? Yes, sir. And his risk for harm was low, right, for both self and others. Correct. Right. Um, and, and there was a diagnosis, right? Unspecific. 
Unspecified psychosis, yes, sir. Unspec unspecified psychosis, not due to a substance or physiological condition, right? Sure. So you knew is the diagnosis they had, right? Sure. And on the next page, section six, as recommendations and comments for commander, that's recommendations and comments for you, correct? And it's the uh, fifth box is checked and it says, ensure service member attends all follow-up appointments, right? Yes. Did you do that? I was not provided and it's discharged as far as when his follow-up appointments were. Did you do anything to see whether he was following up on his appointments for uh, um, post-hospitalization um, treatment? Due to having no um, no information from the, regarding his discharge, I did not um, have any way to follow, uh, to know what appointments he was supposed to have um, outside of a conversation I believe with Staff Sergeant Hodgson, um, maybe shortly after he's discharged, he had mentioned that. Hodgson told you he was? No, I, I cannot remember that exact conversation. So. Did you? Talk to Card and ask him if you were, what his uh, appointments were. I did not. You had authority to do that, didn't you? To speak with Card. Yeah, and ask him what what your appointment your uh, I mean, release. Yes, I could speak with Card. And you never did. I did not know. And did you ask uh, Sergeant Mo to find out what his appointments were? I do not recall asking him to do that. So can you point to anything that you did to uh, make sure you attended the follow-up appointments? The next uh, box is box is increased leader supervisory support with intent of keeping service member engaged with unit members and other sources of support. You didn't have an August uh, uh, battle. Um, battle. Was there any opportunity for you to increase uh, his engagement with unit members after his release from forward? I knew that um, from Seiko Staff Sergeant Hodgson that uh, immediately following his discharge that Staff Sergeant Hodgson uh, was uh, constantly with him as what we call in the military as like a battle buddy or a ranger buddy. Um, he, you know, they would do everything. They would, you know, worked, you know, where I think believe they worked at that time at the same job together, um, and that he was looking out for him. Um, but due to the, the nature of being a reserve uh, component, this coming from an active duty uh, command uh, on the West Point, there an active duty uh, facility is difficult to necessarily increase leader supervisor support. And in the when I or my his supervisors are um, do not see. That this soldier um, until the one week in the month and two weeks a year, sir. The next is consider placement of service member in barracks for increased support and potentially reduced access to weapons. Did that apply here? Doesn't apply to reserves. You don't put, you don't have barracks. I do not have barracks, sir. The next box is encourage service member to use gun locks and gun safes or temporarily secure personal weapons with MPs, unit, arms room, or other trusted source. Did you do any of those things? Knowing that I, at the time, uh, my understanding was that the weapons were with the family, um, which it could be understood to be a trusted source, um, but I did not necessarily speak to him regarding um, securing his, uh, using gun locks, um, gun safes. Um, so did you uh, fulfill any 
any strike that did you do anything to fulfill this uh, recommendation? The encourage the service service member. Yeah. No, I did not take any action regarding this. And then uh, the next box is restrict access to or disarm all military weapons and ammunition, no range duties. You see that? Did you do that? Uh, since well, this applies to um, the so on an every day or every monthly basis, the weapons, um, the military weapons, as they indicate, uh, are locked in a safe, uh, a vault, if you will. Uh, for, say, a normal battle assembly, but if we were to go down to uh, Fort Devens um, or Fort Dix or any other train where we'd have to qualify, that would be, but that, that was not the case because he did not show up to battle assembly in October, which was our Fort Devens training. Sorry. Did you, uh, did you take any plans to restrict his access at the next battle assembly? used firearms? Well, understanding that he was, um, that ultimately because of the vault, uh, and everybody was re essentially restricted from that, sir. But at some point in time in, his, in your training, you would use weapons again, right? You would train with firearms. Yes, um, but since we had completed the annual training, uh, the next time we, we would have utilized or pulled out those weapons, if you will. Uh, would have been for October's battle assembly outside of having somebody. Yeah, that's her. Yes, sir. Was it your plan to allow him full access to firearms and, and weapons the next time he had the opportunity at a battle assembly? Man. I cannot recall a, a, a plan to do so. I mean, we had the, the training in October. Um, had he been there, I cannot, I can, but he was not, he was not at the, the battle assembly in October, so I can't say what we would have would have done, sir. There's no discussion in advance with Sergeant Mode or anybody else to restrict his no, there was no discussion. Okay. Now let's look down at further comments. It says in the uh, third line from the bottom, it is recommended that service members chain of command stay engaged with the service members care and once discharged to HOR be followed up with case management and brigade medical officer. So also command and RMO initiate MEB process. Let's take that in steps. You, you, you talked uh, about uh, your engagement with his, his care, correct? Right? Is, is there anything else about his uh, um, care that uh, you were involved in? By his care, can we just go back over that? I don't know what we've discussed. You you uh, have you didn't do anything to uh, make sure he complied with uh, or, or attended the appointment that were made for him, right? No, I was um, due to having not been provided any of the discharge requirements as far as when his appointments were. So I have seen emails from case managers, uh, status of profile. Um, no, I did not. Uh, did not. Know his, or I guess, uh, and then it says that once discharged to HOR, which is for him made, correct? His home of record, yes. He followed up with case management and brigade medical officer. Did you do anything along those lines? That is above me, sir. Sorry? That's above me, sir. Case management is. 
something that it, it's above my level as a company commander and the brigade um, is two levels higher than me, sir. So did you refer this up to chain of command? Um, we, due to the CCIR, um, as uh, Sergeant Major Colmec had in, uh, that is a, a form of communication um, up, the, up the chain of command regarding the incident, and as well as me informing my battalion commander of the incident. Um, as far as they then usually take the uh, the information and relay it to the next level, sir. So how would you know about it? Did you get this information? I personally did not provide them this information, but um, I provided my next level. Um, I informed throughout this whole process um, regarding his hospitalization. Uh, maybe not specifically this document, but um, the discharge and inform my battalion uh, level, which is my one step higher than me of what was going on, sir. You know, do you know of any steps that uh, the chain of command took to comply with this recommendation? I am not, sir. And what's the MEB process? The med board process, sir. And that takes a while to initiate, doesn't it? It, it is, from my experience, it, it is a, a process that takes some time, sir. I can't give an exact time. Did you do anything to initiate it? No, sir. Why not? Oftentimes, in my experience with the med board process, it, it, uh, it's done at a higher level, uh, initiated at a higher level, and then I saw that there was case managers through emails uh, that they were attempting to reach out to him. Um, so I assumed that that was being handled at that level. So you you had no involvement in that whatsoever. Side of. Okay, and finally, the last sentence says, it is also recommended that measures be taken to safely remove all firearms and weapons from as service members HOR, right? I guess so. You agree that that was a good recommendation? I agree that it was a good recommendation. And you agree because he posed a danger to others? Posed a low risk, sir. You posed enough of a risk that you didn't want him to have firearms in his house, right? According to this email that we are reading through, uh, he posed a, a low risk to himself or others. Uh, discussion whether the the where the location of removal of firearms was uh, discussed, and I received through Staff Sergeant Hodgson. You stated that the family agreed to remove the weapons from the home, sir. Did you follow up with the family yourself? I did not, sir, no. Why not? Because it was an agreement between Sergeant Card, a uh, civil agreement between Sergeant Card and um, his family to remove the firearm, which is a civil agreement, and having no authority. Me personally, in the Army Reserves, I have no authority to remove um, to remove the firearms from or to. Uh, oh, basically, I have no authority to to remove the firearms from this residence. What do you mean, a civil agreement between Card and his family? My understanding was that it was the agreement to have the firearms removed out. Of uh, was was by his family. Uh, family agreed to remove the firearms. It was the understanding that I had, uh, which to me is my understanding through law enforcement training. It's a civil agreement between him and his family to have the firearms removed. Okay. It's not a binding lawful agreement, right? It is not. No, sir. I mean, those guns belong to Card, not his family, right? Get along the card, yes, and we can get them back anytime he wants, right? My understanding, yes. Okay, so it's not a very effective agreement if somebody's intent on doing harm with those guns, right? Um, yes, based on that, said yes. 
So let me go back to the danger he posed. You would agree with me that he did pose a danger, correct? The others. Yes, a low risk, yes, sir. But enough of a risk that you had him sent to the to Keller. Yes, sir. With two people watching him the whole way. Yes, sir. And one following. Yes, sir. And then New York State Police following them. Yes, sir. So that's pretty significant, isn't it? At, at the time, his behavior, yes, indicated okay. such as. Did you think about calling uh, Saginaw Hawk Sheriff's Office, calling Sergeant Ma uh, Sheriff Mary yourself, letting him know about this? Why not? It just, I, I didn't do it, sir, so I don't. I know, but is, is there a reason or has it just never occurred to you? It didn't occur to me. At some point, you suggested that uh, Sergeant Mote initiate communications with Saginaw Hawk, right? Referring to the September. Yeah. Yes, sir. Why did you do it then, but not in, in uh, July? Well, the, the threat that we received from Seth Sergeant Hudson. So. But in terms of communicating, was it just that you value, you uh, appraised, appraised that risk at, as lower in July than you did in September? My understanding is that based on the actions that initially happened in July, that we ended up getting to a hospital, that he had um, exhibited, obviously, the signs. We got him to the hospital where he was treated. My understanding, that's why we got him to the hospital, so he could be further treated and evaluated. And he was subsequently transported to a higher level care where he was treated, as far as I would understand, um, at a hospital that he was treated and then discharged. That at that point, he, I would like and assumed that he would be at a, they would not have released him if they did believe he was a danger to himself or others, um, so that he should be in a better position than he was at the beginning of July, or at the, the beginning of this process in July, certainly. And then receiving the text message in September, um, we deemed that it was, uh, that we needed to uh, contact the, uh, and do a check while being served. Okay, well, we'll get to that. But, you also received a phone call in, um, from Mike Kelly, right? Uh, yes. He's a caseworker at Four Winds. I cannot recall that conversation. Exhibit 10A. 10A? E. 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 Yes. And uh, about two thirds of the way down the page, you see progress notes. Yes, sir. In the third line, it says, Mr. Kelly is calling service members command to have all firearms removed to service members home. So they thought that even after his release, he should have no access to guns, right? Well, this was taken during 728, so he was still in. Yeah, but they were recommending that the guns be removed from his house so that he didn't have access to them after he was discharged, right? Correct, which was what the family was supposed to be doing, sorry, yes. Okay, let me ask you, we'll get to the family in a minute. Sergeant Hudson was uh, one of Mr. Card's uh, best friends in the unit? Yes, sir. And you thought that was a genuine friendship? Yes, sir. 
and they took care of each other? Yes, sir. Yes. And um, Hodgson is not was not allowed to possess firearms for a period of time, correct? Correct. Uh, because of a domestic domestic violence conviction. Yes, sir. But uh, you considered him an honest person. <clears throat> No question about that, right? You've said on several occasions that he's an honest person, right? To my experience, yes. Regarding Sergeant Card, he is an honest person, yes. So did you have any contact with Robert Card between the time of his release from Four Winds to uh, mid-September? I spoke with him on the 15th of September. Okay. But no contact between his release from Four Winds to the 15th of September? No, because I spoke with Staff Sergeant Hodgson, who is keeping me updated on his process as well as, you know, Sergeant Card. And did Hodgson tell you the guns were out of the, out of the house? I think I recall if he told me that specifically. It was important to you, wasn't it? I could just say that he did. I can't recall that conversation. Sir. The safety plan was to have the family members remove the guns. There was no backup to that plan, was there? Not from the Army Reserve standpoint, sir. And you never called the uh, Card's family yourself, did you? I did not, sir. So you didn't. You couldn't tell whether they were able to uh, get possession of those firearms. I was not able to speak to the family to confirm that, no, sir. And did you know, know that Card had virtually no contact with them except through his brother? And that his brother had had little contact with him for several months? I stated I don't know their dad. Okay. <clears throat> And even if, just to make sure it's clear, even if the family did take possession of the firearms, Robert Carr could always get them back. Very well could have, but that would have been if the... And Robert Card could always get new guns, even if he um, gave his current his current guns to his brother, right? He could always get a new gun. He wasn't a prohibited person, was he? Not that I'm aware, sir. So. Since families can't police their own, was it a very good plan that relied on the family to get the guns? As I stated, I don't know the family dynamic. I didn't know the family dynamic. Uh, so I can't comment on whether that plan was good, but it was a plan. And in my law enforcement experience that families often have removed firearms, and it is a, a valuable or a, a viable plan to remove uh, firearms. And that is the family determined that um, that for some reason, if he was unable to, uh, he wanted the weapons back, and they didn't think that they would be contacting because it's outside of the army's jurisdiction. Uh, we don't have dominion or power over that. That they would reach out to the local law enforcement if they had concerns. Well, they had reached out to their local law enforcement, hadn't they? Yes. And they've done that several months before, haven't they? Yes, sir. And nothing happened, right? Yes, sir. Okay. That I'm aware, sir. So wouldn't a better plan be to get a court order? 
again, as a Army not, Army Reserve officer, I have no dominion to be able to apply for that. That would have been through the local, uh, my understanding of Maine's laws come from the local law enforcement officers. But you're in law, you are a law enforcement officer. In New Hampshire, yes. You had law enforcement officers in your unit, right? Yes, sir. Including a sheriff? Yes, sir. And you never asked that sheriff to call Sergeant Mar uh, Sir Sheriff uh, Mary? I spoke directly with First Sergeant regarding this um, because of his his knowledge and experience with the, the main law. I who, trusted him. Who did you talk to? First Sergeant Mode, sir. Okay, but you never talked to Wentworth? I did not, sir, no. Why not? Because in terms of speaking with my first sergeant, who is the my right hand man and his knowledge and experience, I trusted that, sir. What would be the downside of asking a sheriff? best way to approach this a sheriff in your unit who has knowledge of this who was there when he was committed to the hospital in new york all i can say is i did not speak with sir uh, wayne Wright regarding this sir you think that sheriff mary would want to know that a person in this jurisdiction was suffering symptoms of psychosis and paranoia Experiencing auditory hallucinations of people saying he's a pedophile, saying things that are ominous, like he'll take care of it or he's got the capacity to take care of it. He's a trained marksman. And that uh, the mental health professionals that you uh, uh, work with and are treating him recommend that he not have guns in his home. Do you think Sheriff Mary would want to know that? I've seen that work before you came, sir. Department, I'm not sure if everybody in what position. How would he know uh, um, what happened in New York? Well, in New York, I, I, I well, that would have came from what my, from First Iron Boat's testimony that. Oh, that that was so you keep your voice up. Oh, I apologize. Yeah. Um, that first um, that was relayed um, during the message. Uh, when first RMO requested the check will be sorry. That was in September. Yes, so after July, or after August third, when he was released from Four Winds, up to the time that he threatened to shoot up the Saco uh, Center. Sheriff Mary was kept in the dark, right? You're referring to, did I contact him? No, I can say, no, I did not contact him. This has been a person in Nashville. Would you want to know? Speculating, but I mean, Yes, we, we do, but we do things differently in Nashua. I, mean, I don't know the policies of what they do in the Sagahawk County, but if you're referring to if somebody was in Nashua that had these, uh, it's hard to say what Nashua would do because we weren't involved in, in he, would, he did not live in Nashua, so it's hard for me to speculate on what we would have done, sir. You would have wanted to know about this, wouldn't you? As a, sir, as a national police officer? As a national police officer, you would want to know that somebody facing those circumstances was in the community. It would be beneficial to know, sir, yes. And you said several times that Things are handled differently in Nashua. How are they handled differently? I stated it once, but 
And you said it a couple of times in interviews. It's, it's, it's hard to, to state um, what we would have done. I can tell you. It's it's hard to state, sir, that what, what we would have done in Nashville because the supervisors, I'm not sure that, that obviously I think believe the county sheriffs is a little bit smaller. In Nashville, we have a much larger uh, unit, so supervisors would have been more involved, I believe, sir. Okay, and how would that affect the outcome? They would have provided advice. They would have known the procedures that, you know, how we would have handled it um, given the same incident, sir. What's your rank in Nashville? I am just a master patrolman, sir. I didn't, I didn't hear your answer. You've got to keep your voice up. Oh, I apologize. Uh, master patrolman, sir. And uh, would Nashua have um, been more aggressive? I, I, because it did not occur in Nashville, I cannot answer for what my supervisors or whoever would have been the one that initially take that call. I can't answer on what they would have done, sir. So when you say we would have handled it differently in Nashville, what do you mean? Basically, what I mean is that if, if I had taken this call, um, this would have been um, reviewed by my supervisors um, and if they determined um, going all the way back to when I believe the sheriff's county was involved they would have uh, you know possibly provided more advice knowing the procedures sir and then that would have dictated going forward sir but it's hard to say sir so is it, I don't want to read this course any further can you tell us how or what in, in specific terms Nashville would do differently it, it is very difficult for me to say because I do not know from the, the start of this um, instance as far as I understand the involvement with the police um, how we would have handled things differently sir Let's um, turn, just in terms of the time here, I want to get to um, the events of September 15th. Can we possibly take our last break? Sure. It's been a little while. Is it okay to take a break? Yes. Yeah, okay. How long do you mean? Five minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Five minutes. We'll take a five minute break. Thank you. I won't leave. I know how that happens. Yeah. <laughs>
So let's turn to uh, September 15th in the early morning. Did you receive a text directly from um, Sergeant Hodgson? Yes, sir. What time do you uh, recall or did you receive that uh, text? We're about approximately two in the morning. Did you send a text to uh, Sergeant Mode as well. His testimony it sounds like yes. From his testimony, it sounds like yes. And one version that we have that was uh, sent at two o four does not have the final sentence that we see on the um, one sent at two ten. Says, I just don't know where he's up and down. Um, is the one that we received from the Army last night, is that from your phone? The one you're looking at right there, yes, yeah. that is my That's from your phone, yes. okay. So we heard uh, through Sergeant Mo. The contents of this email. Um, text message. Excuse me, text message. Was that pretty concerning to you when you received it? Yes, sir. And um, what did you do in response? Upon waking up in the morning uh, that day at around seven uh, in the morning, I can't remember exactly, uh, I observed the text message. Um, Contacted the first RMO, um, confirmed that he, he received the text message as well, um, and that he had contacted so at some point. I can't can't remember when I called uh, or spoke with uh, first RMO, but um, that he had reached out to um, Seth Sergeant Hodgson regarding uh, the text message, and my conversation with first RMO, he had attempted to get more information regarding furthering that uh, the threat as far as to, was there any anything more he wanted to add? Did he you know, see the weapons or anything like that? Um, from, and from my conversation, it sounded like uh, Staff Sergeant Hodgson did not provide any further uh, uh, further information from the outside of the text message that he had sent, sir. At that point, we started developing a uh, course of action to present to the battalion commander uh, where it was discussed, um, you know, reaching out, uh, doing a check well being, uh, and uh, potentially talking about uh, having um, notifying the Saco Police Department regarding the, the threat. Um, and after we discussed that uh, for some time, I contacted my my battalion commander informed him of the threat uh, that we received uh, in the course of action that first R and I uh, developed, uh, and he agreed to it. At which point, I uh, requested first R and Mo work on getting tech well being initiated um, and, and going through it the the course of action that route. Then um, I did uh, when I, I did attempt to contact Sergeant Card that morning, uh, called not the message. Then uh, later on, after I spoke with First RMO, I 
reached out to a full-time staff to have them reach out to Sergeant First Class Card and see if they would be able to have them contact me. And at approximately 2 p.m., uh, Sergeant Card had contacted me and called me, and I spoke with him uh, regarding uh, the... I spoke with him, and he asked him what was going on, and he stated that he... Um, was angry and frustrated with the events of the summer. Uh, that uh, he didn't make any specific threats regarding shooting up any place. The only threat that I heard from him was uh, that Hunter Reed. And um, I asked him if he was going to be at the drill or up at the battle assembly. He stated no. He stated he was going to have to work because of because of the hospitalization. Um, and having to, I guess, what I understood to be uh, make more money, but he confirmed he wasn't going to be at drill or at battle assembly. Um, and that he made comments about looking to retire, um, at which point I, uh, the end of the conversation was stating that I would have his platoon sergeant um, reach out to him and, and provide some information regarding his, what what's required because in the uh, in the army reserves uh, to retire is uh, th there are some steps that need to be taken. It does take some time, um, and it's a more action than one would think a service member needed to do. Um, so uh, I was going to have his supervisor, uh, his platoon sergeant, reach out to him and to kind of inform him what needed to happen, sir. So let me go back to uh, your first conversation with. Sergeant Mode, after you received the text. Yes, sir. Um, did you ask him to write out a, a narrative regarding his uh, conversation with Card? No, I did not. So it wasn't your plan that that narrative would be, in effect, converted into an affidavit for a search warrant, I mean, for a, a warrant for um, yellow flag. No, the um, discussion I had with First RMO was that a check well being um, needed to be, uh, we would like to request a check well being uh, from the local police department and to notify SACO PD. That was the plan. And then uh, I would later find out what First RN ended up taking and, and going through that route. He did inform me that he, he did speak with his police department um, later and decided to speak with them about it. Um, but our discussion was a check well being and notifying Saco Police Department. Well, why not? Or did you consider having charges filed against him for threatening or terrorizing? No, that that I did not think of that. No, sir. Why not? That did not come to my mind, sir. Okay. In, in, in retrospect, now I, 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 I know it's unfair to ask people to um, go. In retrospect, do you think you had enough to charge him at that time with terrorizing or threatening? Based on our actions and my discussion, I believe that the check well being was needed, and that's what we ended up doing, sir. Okay. But did you have the basis to charge him? I do not know it's main state law regarding that, sir. But the bottom line is it was never discussed. Charges to charge him? Charging him criminally. No, sir. So if instead of the unit being threatened, it had been the Nashua High School, would you want to have charged the person who made the threats? to shoot up the Nashville High School. The threats were not toward Nashville High School, sir. I understand. But if it had been Nashville High School, wouldn't you have considered charging the person who made the threats? We would have done an investigation, sir. And a criminal investigation, right? We would have had a complaint, um, and we would have done our due diligence regarding mm -hmm. that, sir. With the goal of charging him criminally. That depends on the course of the investigation, sir. Right. 
19. But that was never considered here. Well, at the time it was to, put, to have a check well being completed, sir. And what was the purpose of the check well being? As stated from previous, or previous uh, testimonies, was to um, have the police respond out to check his mental um, health, well being um, status, and get essentially eyes on him from a law enforcement perspective, sir. And to see if he was a risk of harm to himself or others? Yes, sir. And that was an essential part of the request, right? It's part of a check will be in. Yes, sir. Well, sometimes it's just my um, my mother isn't answering her phone. Can you check on her at the house? Well, with with this, yeah, yes, uh, it was part of the because of the text messages and the way that the check will be in ended up being presented up. Yes, you know that that text message with the threat that was part of it, sir. Yes, and let's look at. Uh, Sergeant Moat's narrative. What page is that, sir? It's um we actually have it. <laughs> Do you have document three up there? No, the okay. Other, the other Look at exhibit four. Look at mm -hmm. exhibit three. four. Oh. Exactly. Right. Do you have a document three? It's three. Okay. Exhibit four. Yes, the last two paragraphs. It's document three. Document, yeah, document three. Let's say document three up in the right hand corner. Remember, the court reporter is supposed to be taking all of this down. <laughs> <laughs> when you all talk at once, there isn't a chance. We'll give you a copy of it. Okay. Yes, I recognize that as the uh, narrative with Sergeant. Uh, prepared. I have I have not actually seen this narrative, but I understand obviously Corporal Kelvin Moat to be in my first sergeant. Yes. You never saw it, his email. No, sir. Well, let's look at it then. The next to last paragraph, halfway down, it says, according to Hodgson. Hard said he has guns and is going to shoot up the drill center at Saco and other places. <coughs> he also said he was going to get them, in quotes. Since the commander and I are the ones who had him committed, we are the them. Did you know that? Did Sergeant Moat tell you that? I can't recall that conversation, sir. He also said I, meaning Moat, was the reason he can't buy guns anymore because of the commitment. So he's pretty specific about who he's, when I say who, he, Card was pretty specific about what he was going to do, wasn't he? According to this, yes, sir. And then in the last paragraph, it says, Captain Reamer asked that I have Saginaw County conduct a well-being check on card at his residence to gauge his mental health and determine if he's a threat to himself and or other, others. Again, so that's a two-part purpose. I agree with that, yes. And then he says, the soccer PD has been given a heads up about this and the battalion commander has been briefed as to the threat to the unit in Saka, right? That's what it says, yes. And you agree that it was a threat to the unit in Saka, right? Based on the text messages, yes. I would rather err on the side of caution with regards to Card, since he is a capable marksman, and if he should set his mind to carry out the threats made to Hodgson, he would be able to do it. Do you agree with that? Did you agree with that sentiment? It, it made sense to err on the side of caution? Yes. So why call Moat 
to have him called Sagadhat instead of just calling Sagadhat yourself. Well, as the first time motivated his testimony, with his understanding of the laws in Maine, as well as his connections in Maine, um, I delegated that to him uh, to do so. That you that the Saco police would be more responsive if they got a phone call from somebody from Ellsworth and uh, somebody from Nashua. Can't speak to if they what Saco would do, sir. Was that your when you was that a factor in your consideration? Just having uh, first RMO being a police officer in the state in which. Uh, sorry, card was in. Our conversation just he agreed to do it, and that was the decision we wanted to. Did you agree that the well being check was never completed by Second Hawk? It's on their definition of the checkbook. My understanding is they responded out, and that he, they noted that they believed he was in the, in the residence. But there was no contact with him, sir. You wanted it, you were asking for a face to face, right? And that was what I was requesting. Okay. Um, and, and to document what they had, sir. You kept using the term document. What did, were you looking for specifically? After confirming with my battalion commander and sergeant major that you know, what, what we were looking for was essentially a, a check well being, as we discussed earlier. Um, but I understand that, um, and I, I, I cannot speak to what Sagahawk County Sheriff's, their procedures, their policies, I don't know what they what they do, but what we were looking for them to do is to respond out, uh, to check on him, uh, and determine the best course of action based on the information uh, they had, sir. So I can't, I can't dictate how they do their job, sir. Right, but in terms of a well-being check, you have to have face-to-face -face direct contact, right? From my experience, yes, you attempt to make you do everything you can to do a face-to-face, -face, sir, just to confirm the well-being, yes, sir. So, based on what you know from uh, work, <laughs> you mean? Uh, Sergeant Schofield has said about it, you know that they never did have face-to-face -face contact, right? From my understanding that day, they did not know. So it was an incomplete. You make that argument. Did you, did Saginaw County ever tell you that before uh, October? They hadn't had face-to-face? -face? No, the only conversation I had with them was um, on the 16th of September, sir. Okay, and they were going to try again. They, they were going to keep trying to have that face to face, right? When they talked to I, I can recall if that was part of the conversation I had. But, but you never called after the 17th again to check and see if they had face to face. Well, So let's talk about the SACO unit. What uh, steps did you take to protect the uh, unit if Robert Card showed up? The plan that we developed, uh, well, upon, upon driving in that day, um, noticed that SACO Police Department were in the area. Um, so I had informed everybody, uh, or at least the leadership that was there um, of the threat. But I also indicated that I did speak with Sergeant Card uh, the day prior where he stated that, you know, that he wasn't going to be arriving. Um, he wasn't going to be here. Uh, our plan uh, was to, um, if he was to show up, that we would uh, notify uh, we kind of let everybody know and 
my plan was to, to head out if he did, and we would kind of engage with him outside of the the uh, the reserve center. And since my conversation with Sergeant Card the day prior, he had mentioned Reed again. Uh, the plan was then to get Reed out of the building if he was to show up um, through a different exit, sir. That was the plan that we had internally, sir. Okay, so you didn't authorize anybody to call Saco PD? About this threat? Well, I spoke with first sergeant the day prior. Um, the course of action we created was that Saco Police Department be notified, sir. By Mo. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and then you know the file six was it was uh, issued, right? I'm not sure what a file six is, but uh, below what I understand, if that's what it is, that I, I heard um, on coming into the reserve center, um, a couple of the uh, state police or or other officers, law enforcement officers, indicated that uh, when you guys called file six was. Was completed, sir. So, Mo was supposed to call um, Saginaw PD, uh, Saginaw Sheriff's Office, and uh, Saco. Yeah, that was the plan. Yes, sir. And you weren't surprised when you saw Saco PD out front. You took the threat seriously. Yes, sir. That uh, that your soldiers were at risk of harm from based on the text message. Then I do I will say that after my conversation with Card the day prior, um, that it did lessen it a little bit than than what it was when I first woke up that day, sir. <clears throat> So tell us about that phone call with Carr. What do you recall him saying? I can, I can go over it again. Um, but my conversation, um, he called me uh, and I asked him what was going on. And um, he said he was angry and frustrated with the events of the, the summer um, that he uh, you know, just wanted to punch Reed. Um, that when I asked if he was going to be heading to, or if he was going to be at drill, he stated no, um, and that he was going to be working. That he was just looking to retire, and then I provided him as far as what this platoon sergeant would be doing, providing him some information, sir. Did you ask him if he'd been getting any treatment? I did not during that conversation. No, sir. Did you ask him if he had the guns? I did not. Did you say to him that um, Hodgson tells us you have guns? Anything else about that call? When you arrived, um, you talked to the Saco police who had been uh, watching the entryways to the unit, right? Uh, eventually, I was informed that they, they had come into the reserve center and wished to speak with me, yes, sir. Let's briefly look at um, exhibit 11. On the second page, page 81 at the bottom, you you with me yet? Yeah? 
Uh, what? Up in the upper right hand corner, it should say 11. It'll be in the you east. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. So it's the second page. Second page. You say about uh, a third of the way down the page. I'm a cop in New Hampshire, so a little bit different than how you guys do it. And then on the next page, <clears throat> third of the way down, you tell the psycho police officers, just for the record, this is a transcript of your conversation with the psycho police officers at the unit that morning, right? Here's the beat. When you say he being um, Hodgson was unable to really give any specifics. The guy only specifically mentioned one of my soldiers and said he wanted to punch him. I want to punch him in the face. That was kind of the only specifics. He did say, you know, that he would shoot places, but never specifically mentioned here. Right? Wasn't really direct, was it? Actually, was giving specifics. He did mention the unit, sir. I'd have to look back over the text message, sir. And then he also referred to you and Moat, right? For having him committed, according to Sergeant Moat's uh, email. According to yes, his email yesterday. Why not? Why not mention to the Sarko PD what had happened in New York? I think I was having a conversation. It didn't come to my mind. Did you ask Sarko PD to, and you didn't ask Sarko, Sarko PD to charge him, did you? No, sir. I, I, um, I have a new topic. I have one short area that sure. I think we should probably have. Let me, let me go back. Um, let me ask you a little bit about your background. Um, can you describe your education? Uh, yes, I uh, have a bachelor's degree in business management. Where? Uh, Eastis College. In, uh, up in upstate New York? Western New York. Yeah. Um, and when did you get that? I graduated in 2011. Okay. And uh, what, tell us about your uh, career since 2011. In um, uh, graduating um, in 2011, uh, since I was going through the ROTC program, I became a second lieutenant. By then, uh, I was a, uh, for lack of a better word, recruiter for the college for the stent. And then in 2012, we, one of the month, early months there, I went to uh, infantry, uh, infantry off the basic course, three school, uh, in the beginning of 2012. And then I attended ranger school after um, I Bullock and after completing ranger school, I uh, uh, was stationed at Fort John 287 Infantry as a platoon leader. Then I uh, served as a platoon leader for um, a year or two and uh, we, uh, 2013, uh, one deployment uh, to Afghanistan. About partly through there, I was switched over to as company commander, or not a company, a company executive officer, an XO, uh, for 
uh, the remainder of the deployment and partially coming back, but when uh, then was moved into battalion as a um, uh, uh, S3 or an operations um, officer, their assistant uh, S3, where I completed my active duty time and in 2015 left the duty. Then had a five year stint where I was um, not with um, any Army Reserve component um, and then came back. I was in the IRR, if you will and then came back in in 2020 into the Army Reserves, where I did a year as a CMO or a career management officer, and then was moved over into uh, as a company commander. And that was my military. Where were you uh, originally when you joined the Reserves? Where were you based? I was in New Hampshire. And then you came to Maine in 20, what year? 2021. 20, so, I, yes, I became a, uh, um, I, when I became the, the company commander, I, uh, I, 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 I were stationed out of SACO, as we discussed earlier, sir. So tell us about your, anything more on your military career? Um, attended airborne school and, uh, yeah, ranger school. Tell us about your uh, civilian career. Uh, currently a law enforcement officer for National Police Department and have been for seven and a half years. Prior to that, in between the military, I was a uh, uh, outreach uh, for a nonprofit veteran organization. This is a good place to start. We've exhausted us, probably you and I, I uh, and perhaps some others, but we'll suspend at this point and we'll be in touch with you with regard to any further uh, questioning we might have. So thank you very much for everyone for appearing today. And we will adjourn if there is a motion to adjourn. So moved. So Seconded. Seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed to being no. Motion carries. Thank you.